On the 24th day of the same month, the Israelites assembled. They were fasting and wearing sackcloth. Their heads were covered with dust. Those truly of Israelite descent, separated from all the foreigners, standing and confessing their sins and the iniquities of their ancestors. For one fourth of the day, they stood in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God. And for another fourth, they were confessing their sins and worshiping the Lord their God. Then the Levites, Jeshua, Benui, Cadmiel, Shebaniah, Bunai, Sherebiah, Bani, and Canaanai stood on the steps and called out loudly to the Lord their God. The Levites, Jeshua, Cadmiel, Bani, Hashabaniah, Sherebiah, Hodiah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God. May you be blessed, O Lord our God, from age to age. May your glorious name be blessed. May it be lifted up above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, along with all their multitude of stars, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You impart life to them all, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him forth from Ur of the Chaldeans. You changed his name to Abraham. When you perceived that his heart was faithful toward you, you established a covenant with him to give his descendants the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Girgashites. You have fulfilled your promise, for you are righteous. You saw the affliction of our ancestors in Egypt, and you heard their cry at the Red Sea. You performed awesome signs against Pharaoh, against his servants, and against all the people of his land, for you knew that the Egyptians had acted presumptuously against them. You made for yourself a name that is celebrated to this day. You split the sea before them, and they crossed through the sea on dry ground, but you threw their pursuers into the depths like a stone into surging waters. You guided them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to illumine for them the path they were to travel. You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven. You provided them with just judgments, true laws, and good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath. You issued commandments, statutes, and laws to them through Moses, your servant. You provided bread from heaven for them in their time of hunger, and you brought forth water from the rock for them in their time of thirst. You told them to enter in order to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. But they, our ancestors, behaved presumptuously. They rebelled and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and did not recall your miracles that you had performed among them. Instead, they rebelled and appointed a leader to return to their bondage in Egypt. But you are a God of forgiveness, merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and unfailing in your loyal love. You did not abandon them, even when they made a cast image of a calf for themselves and said, this is your God who brought you from Egypt, or when they committed atrocious blasphemies. Due to your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not stop guiding them in the path by day, nor did the pillar of fire stop illuminating for them by night the path on which they should travel. You imparted your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths. You provided water for their thirst. For 40 years you sustained them. Even in the wilderness, they never lacked anything. Their clothes did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to come together to hear from your word, to remember who you are, to meet with you as we open your word. Pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be with us, that you would open our eyes and our minds to see you for who you are and to hear what you have to say to us today. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, 
Uh, it's so good to see you all. Thank you all so much uh, for making the effort, and I know it was an effort uh, to be here this morning, even maybe just to be sitting where you're sitting since we don't have AC in this room. And all the online people right now are like, yeah, this is fine. This is good. I'm, I'm in my car. I'm in my house. I'm wherever. We're glad that you're joining us too. I, I just want to say before we jump in that at least for me so far this morning has, has been a little bit uh, unexpected. Things haven't gone exactly how they normally do on a Sunday morning. And as I was thinking, actually, we were praying as a team before the service started. And I just this, this kind of thought or impression came to my mind that isn't it true that God likes to kind of upset what's normal in order for us to be open to him moving in some unexpected way? Have y'all ever had that? And I just wonder whether even in the heat with the fans waving like we're somewhere in the south, I don't, I don't know, this is not normal for Tacoma, but I wonder if in the not normal of today, God is at work and is moving and wants to move in this group of people, wherever you're at today. Uh, this morning, we're continuing in our sermon series in the book of Nehemiah called Build Together. The story that we're looking at, the story of Nehemiah is one of a hopeless people in a hopeless situation until God shows up and God moves and things change. See, when God shows up in your life and God moves, things begin to change for the better. So we're in Nehemiah chapter 9 today. Since we're so far into the story, I want to just start with a quick overview, maybe for those of us who are, you know, just joining for the first time, or maybe you've missed a couple weeks and just need a refresher. Nehemiah is a Jewish man, but he grew up in exile in the empire of Persia. In fact, he worked directly for the king of Persia. He was a cupbearer to the king. He was a poison checker, basically. And one day, while he's at work in sort of the, the palace, he gets some terrible news about his homeland. And it really, it really upsets him. Even though he's never been there, he hears that the city of Jerusalem is lying in ruins. Now, he would have already known that the city had been destroyed more than 100 years earlier when the people of Israel were carried off to exile, but he hears that the city is still lying in ruins and the people are suffering and nobody is doing anything about it. So with the king's blessing and with the hand of God upon him, Nehemiah returns to the city of Jerusalem in order to build the wall, to, to rebuild the city and reestablish the community. So Nehemiah returns and he invites the people to partner with God and partner with him in order to build together. And as we've gone through the book of Nehemiah, we've seen a movement of God happening. God shows up in the people's lives and begins moving through them as they start building. And a couple weeks ago, we saw that they actually finished the wall in 52 days. Only 52 days, they rebuilt the entire wall around the city of Jerusalem so the wall is finished, but the work isn't done yet. After the wall is finished, we've seen God begin working in the people's hearts because it was never God's mission simply to build a wall. God was building his people the entire time. Last week, we saw that the people gathered together for a worship service, basically, and it was a six hour long worship service. They read from the word of God and they responded in, in celebration. They responded with a feast in obedience to the word of God. Today, as we go into Nehemiah chapter 9, we get to see the people continue in their response. Responding to God is not a one-time event. It's, it's a continuous activity. And so we get to see how the people continue their response. And as we do, we see that this time their response has a little bit of a different emphasis to it. So let's start by jumping in to Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. It says, On the 24th day of this same month, the Israelites assembled. They were fasting and wearing sackcloth, their heads covered with dust. Those truly of Israelite descent separated from all the foreigners, standing and confessing their sins and the iniquities of their ancestors. For one-fourth of the day, that's six hours, they stood in their place 
and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God. And for another fourth of the day, that's another six hours, they were confessing their sins and worshiping the Lord their God. Then the Levites stood on the steps and called out loudly to the Lord their God. The Levites said, stand up and bless the Lord your God. So we see here that about three weeks have passed after that first initial worship gathering that we looked at last week in chapter 8. And this actually seems pretty similar in lots of ways to that chapter 8 worship gathering. We see the people are assembling together. We see them reading the word of God. We see the Levites are there to lead the people in worship. But there are also a couple things that kind of tune us into the fact that this gathering is, is different from the last one. It says, this time they come dressed in sackcloth with dust or ashes on their heads. And in that day, this would have been a sign of mourning, a sign of repentance. Why, why were they mourning? In fact, they weren't just mourning. It, it says twice in these first couple verses that they stood and were confessing. So the emphasis of this gathering is, is a little more somber. And it's somber because they've, they've been reading the book of the law. They've been reading God's word for a few weeks now, and they are realizing we have not been doing any of this stuff. And in fact, our parents weren't doing any of this stuff, or our grandparents, or really as far back as we can remember in our family histories, we have not been faithful. And so all of chapter 9 is centered around this idea of confession. Today, we're only going to look at the first half of chapter 9, but we're going to spend the next three weeks thinking about this idea of confession. So if we get to the end of today and you're like, but I feel like there's still more or there's something I don't understand or what, what did you mean by that? That's okay. Just come back the next couple weeks. So we'll, it will hopefully fill in all the blanks as, as we go along. But before we just dive in to this idea of confession, I just want to recognize that even that word confession is really religious sounding. You know, maybe you haven't been to church in a while, or maybe this is your first time in a church gathering, and you're like, really, I came on the confession day? Bye, I'm going to go find the AC. Like, may maybe that's where you're at right now. It is primarily a religious word. In fact, as I was thinking about it, it seems to me like we really only use the word confess or confession in a religious context or a legal context. Like you can either confess a sin or confess a crime, and neither of those things are really things you want to confess. They both kind of have a, a negative connotation to them. Maybe just take a moment, if you're, if you're a note taker and you're like jotting down notes, or if you've got your phone, just take a moment, open up a note, and just maybe write down a couple words that you associate when I say the word confession. What's the first feeling? What's the, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say we're going to talk about confession today? Maybe if you're a little bit more of like a visual person, draw a smiley face of how that word makes you feel. I'll be honest with you, my assumption is that for most of us in this room or online, we either have at best a neutral feeling toward confession, but more likely we probably have a negative connotation in our minds with the word confession. You know, if you were to represent your feelings toward this idea with like an emoji. Maybe you feel like this. Oh, I'm ashamed. I, I, I don't, I don't want to talk about that, but I'll do it in a really low voice just so I can say I did it. Or maybe you feel a little bit more like this, like, I don't want to go there. <laughs> don't, don't make me, that, that's, that's awkward for me. Or maybe you're a little bit more like one of these guys. Either I'm just going to lie my way straight through this thing or I'm going to shut up and not say a word or I'll tell you, but please don't tell anybody else because it might ruin my reputation if this gets out. So I'm not sure about this. Now, as we spend time in Nehemiah chapter 9 today, my hope is to give you a wider picture of what confession is actually is, to, to give us an understanding of confession that we can actually appreciate as something that's good for us, something that we can be invited into practicing on a regular basis. 
Let's, let's get into the actual confession of the people. What do the people say to begin their confession? Look with me at verses 5 and 6. It says, May you be blessed, O Lord our God, from age to age. May your glorious name be blessed. May it be lifted up above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, along with all their multitude of stars, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You impart life to them all, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. So here the people actually start by simply confessing who God is. God, you are creator. You are the ruler over all things. What do they say next? They continue. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him forth from Ur of the Chaldeans. You changed his name to Abraham. When you perceived that his heart was faithful toward you, you established a covenant with him to give his descendants the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Girgashites. You have fulfilled your promise, for you are righteous. So after they establish who God is, they establish God's character, they start thinking about God's actions in their own story. And if you notice, God's actions always flow directly out of his character. But they don't stop here. They, they keep going. Verse 9, you saw the affliction of our ancestors in Egypt, and you heard their cry at the Red Sea. You performed awesome signs against Pharaoh, against his servants, and against all the people of his land. For you knew that the Egyptians had acted presumptuously against them. You made for yourself a name that is celebrated to this day. You split the sea before them, and they crossed through the sea on dry ground. But you threw their pursuers into the depths like a stone into surging waters. You guided them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to illumine for them the path they were to travel. Isn't this an amazing way to begin a confession? For the first seven verses of this confession, all that the people do exclusively is talk about God. That's it. That, that's, that's where they start. The people recognize that God is the one who drives their story forward by his faithfulness. So they start by just naming and remembering who God is. God is the creator. He's the covenant keeper. He's the righteous one. He's the faithful one in all things and all circumstances. He is the savior. And then as they begin to remember who God is, they start to remember his actions and how these actions align with his character. So they remember God's deliverance of his people out of slavery in Egypt. He's a God of miracles. He's a God of salvation, a true and living God. And this is, just, this is where they start, and they just camp out here talking about God. So we see right off the bat that in order to have a proper understanding of confession, a full understanding of confession, it has to include more than just our own failures. I wonder if when I said the word confession, you just drew a big sad face because all you think about is all the stuff you've done wrong. If that's your definition of confession, if it centers around you and everything that you have failed to do, I'd like to encourage you to just set that aside and, and expand your idea of what confession might mean, of what it means to confess. You see in Nehemiah 9, confession always begins with God. Now, as we continue to read, the people go from kind of this overview of who God is and how he acts and they transition into remembering a specific time, a specific episode in their people's history and how God acted in that time. They start to remember the wilderness wanderings of Israel after they've been set free from Egypt. Look with me at verses 13 to 15. It says, You came down on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven. You provided them with just judgments, true laws, and good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath. You issued commandments, statutes, and laws to them through Moses, your servant. 
You provided bread from heaven for them in their time of hunger, and you brought forth water from the rock for them in their time of thirst. You told them to enter in order to possess the land that you had sworn to give them. So the people think back about their ancestors wandering through the desert and what sticks out to them. God's faithfulness and provision is the first thing on their minds. And, and I think that that probably is directly connected to the fact that they were just confessing who God is, not mere moments before. Now, we, we might think that they'd be asking God why it took so long. As they remember this season of their people's history, maybe they'd be asking, like, God, why did it take, you know, 40 years and two generations for them to make a relatively short journey from A to B? But they don't do that. Rather, they marvel at what God has provided. They, they marvel at who God is. Even, even in the hardest time of their people's history, wandering in a desert, no home, on, only the hope of something that they had and then had lost. And still, the, the thing that's primary on their minds is God. But we also see here that rather than just moving on to the next part of Israel's history and saying, well, how did God act here? Then how did God act here? How did God act? They actually pause for a moment in the wilderness and they think about how their ancestors responded to God. How did the people of Israel respond to God's faithfulness? Well, we see it in the next couple of verses. But they, our ancestors, behaved presumptuously. They rebelled and did not obey your commandments. They refused to obey and did not recall your miracles that you had performed among them. Instead, they rebelled and appointed a leader to return to their bondage in Egypt. So maybe this is like a, an obvious answer, but how did the people respond? It was sinfully. They respond rebelliously. It says first that they behaved presumptuously. If you have a different translation, it might use the word arrogantly. There's pride, there's arrogance in their hearts as they respond to God. To, to behave presumptuously is to act as if you know better than God. This is like the people getting into the wilderness, they've been set free from 400 years of slavery in Egypt, and what do they say? This is hard. It would have been better if we died back there. That is acting presumptuously. But, but not only were they arrogant and prideful, it also says they rebelled. The word in Hebrew here is literally translated, they stiffened their necks. This is stubbornness. This is a conscious decision to resist God. But not only did they just stiffen their necks and then just stay where they were, it says they stiffened their necks and then they appointed a leader to return them back to slavery, back to their bondage in Egypt. The people are in all-out rebellion against God. And it would be easy for the people in Nehemiah's day or, or even for us to look at this story and look at how the people responded and say, the silly ancient people, could they not be grateful for anything? Don't, don't they know how faithful God is being to them? Why are they so bad at following God? But I think if we're honest with ourselves, we'd do the same thing. See, just as humans in general, we are really good at rebelling. At the very least, we're really good at, at finding reasons to rebel and then justifying them to ourselves and everybody else who will listen. And it's not like it's like a learned skill or anything like that. We just naturally rebel from a young age. When I was about three years old, this is one of those memories that's not really my memory, but like my parents have told me this story so many times, I can imagine it like an episode of TV. I was like three years old and I was an active kid. I wanted to go play outside with my older brother. And so I walk up, Seth is watching TV. He's about six at this time. And I say, hey, Seth, you wanna go play outside with me? And I'm pretty sure he just like ignored me. He's just like, 
into his cartoons or whatever he was doing. It's like, can't be bothered with the little brother. I'm like, man, that, that's no good. I wanna, I wanna play outside. So I, I take things the next step further and I go and I stand in front of the TV because now he has to pay attention to me. There, there's, there's no other option. Unfortunately, I had forgotten that he was bigger and stronger than me. And so he just got up, shoved me out of the way and plopped back on the couch and kept watching his TV. I'm like, man, I, I still, even though he's treating me bad, I still want to play, play outside with him. So I went up and I found the power button on the TV. I just turned it off and I said, gotcha. Now you have to come play with me. But not only was he bigger and stronger, he was wise in the magic of the TV remote. So he didn't even have to stand up this time to get me out of his, he just like grabbed the remote, turned the TV back on, probably laughed at me, I don't know. At this point, my parents are in the other room and they hear something to the effect of, ow, Drew! They come running around the corner to see what kind of chaos is going on. They see my brother holding his head like in agony on the couch, my plastic, like hard plastic dinosaur toy lying on the floor next to him and little three-year-old Drew in the corner with my nose in the corner. I put myself in timeout. I knew I was rebelling. No one had to tell me how to rebel. It came naturally. I'm a middle child. <laughs> that, that it just was my response. This is natural for us. But this tendency toward rebellion isn't, isn't just limited to our siblings or how we interact with the people around us. This is often how we respond to God. This is even how we respond to God's goodness and faithfulness in our lives. Who among us has never tasted the sweet poison of arrogant words come across our lips? Or, or which one of us is unfamiliar with the aching and soreness that comes from continually stiffening our necks and resisting the very things that are good for us? Or have you honestly, honestly never sought comfort in the warm fur blanket of rebellion, knowing all the while that the blanket is actually a live animal ready to devour you? All of these forms of rebellion are things that we are still prone to today. This is not an ancient phenomenon. This is a human phenomenon. So if I can, just let me ask, what are the areas where you're prone to rebellion? What are the, the situations, when are the times when before you even have time to think about what's happening, you feel your neck start to stiffen? Maybe for you that tends to happen when money is involved. Did your neck just stiffen up a little bit when I said the word money? Do you interact with money in, in a rebellious way? You know, rather than praising God for his provision, his generosity in your life and responding in generosity, do you instead hold tight to everything that's yours as if you are the giver of every good and perfect gift and not God? Or do you feel your neck begin to stiffen when someone tells you that God's word ought to have some bearing on how you conduct your personal relationships? You know, maybe, maybe you think Jesus was just wrong or naive when he said that we should love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us and forgive those who sin against us. Maybe you think that because you would really just rather keep holding on to the hurt and the bitterness and the unforgiveness that you've found comfort in, that you've felt justified in. Or perhaps, perhaps you think that God's plan for sex, that it was created to be enjoyed in the context of monogamous heterosexual marriage, one man, one woman for life. Maybe you think that is just a little bit archaic and outdated. You would be better off, you reason, if you just willingly submit yourself to the culturally accepted form of slavery, slavery to sexual desires. 
rather than submitting yourself to God. Or perhaps, perhaps you've even convinced yourself that your rebellion is so small scale that God won't mind, that he won't notice. After all, you say, we're only living together. As long as we don't go too far, that's okay, right? Or, or maybe you say, you know, I'm only holding on to bitterness to, towards someone that I know that I'll never see again, so no harm, no foul. See, friends, whether you think your rebellion is big enough or, or too small for God to notice, whether you desperately desire to stop rebelling or whether you love your rebellion with everything that is in you, all rebellion is the same in the end. The Bible calls it sin. It separates us from relationship with God. And all of us, all of us are prone to this. You might beg the question, why? Why are we prone to rebellion? And the Bible has a lot to say about that. I'll offer one answer, though, from Nehemiah chapter 9. You know, you might think that it's pretty obvious. After all, they were arrogant. They, they stiffened their necks. They wanted to return to slavery. Like, isn't that bad enough? And yes, all of that is a sinful response. But I don't think that any of it is fundamental. I think that there was something that came first that led to all these forms of rebellion. So where did the people go wrong in their response? I think we see it if we look back at verse 17. It says, They refused to obey and did not recall your miracles that you had performed among them. I think... But in this sentence, we actually see where the people get off track in their response to God. It says there are two things that they didn't do. First, it says they refused to obey. Again, if you have a different translation, there might be a different word used here. Your translation might say they refused to listen. And it, maybe if you're newer to the Bible, you're like, wait, how can, how can those be so different? How can one say obey and one say listen? Or is one a bad translation or something? It's not, it's not the case that one translation is better than the other in this instance. Rather, this is just a case of Hebrew being a little bit more full than our English language, or at least this particular word in Hebrew. The word being translated here is the Hebrew word shema. I want to I hear everybody say shema. That was pretty good. We'll have another chance in just a little bit. It's the word shema. And in Hebrew, as you translate it to English, the word shema can be translated to hear or to listen or to obey. But in fact, the word shema is kind of trying to get at all three of those things all at once. In English, obey and listen are separate categories, and you can do one without doing the other. But in the Hebrew imagination, if you hear me, but you don't do what I say, then you didn't really hear me. You refused to Shema, which is exactly what they're saying their ancestors did. They refused to Shema. And now that I've said Shema like 12 times or something, you're like, this word kind of sounds familiar to me. And, and if that's the case, it's probably because it's kind of the key word in one of the most famous passages in the Hebrew Bible. In fact, it's, it's typically just referred to as the Shema. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you should love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength. This is essentially the original Hebrew confession of faith, the Shema. And the people were instructed to recite this confession of faith every day as they got up in the morning and as they laid down at night. So here, for, for the congregation in Nehemiah 9 to say that they refused to Shema, I think they are saying they refused to listen and they refused to obey, but I can't help but wonder if they refused to confess the Shema. 
if they refused to remind themselves, Shema Yisrael, listen, Israel. They weren't confessing God and it led them into rebellion. But I said there were two things that they didn't do. It also says later in the verse that they did not recall your miracles that you had performed among them. And again, this is a Hebrew word that's, that's so much more full than the English translation. The Hebrew word being translated here is zachar with a really good Somebody say zachar. I don't know if that was better than Shema or not, but stick around for 11 o'clock. We'll try again. I don't know. The Hebrew word zachar is typically translated remember or recall. But it doesn't just mean to remember a certain set of facts. The Hebrew word zachar actually means to recall that something is true and then to act in light of it. That's what it means to remember, at least for, for this group of people. This is why God actually uses this word when he's giving the Ten Commandments. In Exodus chapter 20, when he tells Moses to tell the people, remember the Sabbath, zachar et Shabbat, he's not saying, hey, remember that Saturday exists. Nor is he saying, every once in a while when you feel like it, could you maybe think about the fact that I rested on the seventh day of creation? That's, that's an empty remembering. What God is telling the people here is, yes, you should remember that I rested, and then because of that, you should act in light of it. You also should rest. See, the people need not just to recall a set of facts, but to act in light of what they remember. The point of the people remembering the miracles of God here is that they would behave as if God could take care of them because he already has. Now, so often we think that confession is primarily about the things that we have done. But true confession starts by hearing and remembering who God is and what God has done. You know, until you have confessed God, your confession is incomplete. And in this way, confession is more than just a remedy after the fact of rebellion. It's more than just a band-aid we put over sin. It's actually supposed to act as a safeguard against it. So how does all this apply to us? You know, each week as we've been going through the story of Nehemiah, we've been observing how the people are partnering with God to build together. We see how God moves and how they respond. And we're trying to put ourselves in their shoes because we also want to partner with God as we build our lives. And this week, we see the people remember their story, confessing God and confessing their sin. Today, as we consider how to apply this, I only want us to focus on the God part of confession. Maybe there's like one person that's like, oh, I really wanted to talk about my sin though. Don't worry, we'll, we'll talk about that. We've got two more weeks to talk about this. But today I wanna to invite you to consider confessing God. In fact, I wanna ask you to set aside time this week. Maybe if you already have you know, a time where you set aside to pray or read the Bible, it could be that time where you just confess God. What does that look like? Well, maybe it starts with just identifying who God is, some of the characteristics of God. I would encourage you, just think about the last year. And you're like, I don't want to think about the last year. Think about the last year and just consider what are a few of the characteristics of God that, that you've seen on display. Maybe just come up with a short list, three or five, I don't know, something like that. If you're having trouble finding the, the words or the language to put to it, open up the Bible. I'd say flip to passages like Deuteronomy chapter six, the Shema, or John chapter three, or, or Philippians chapter two. Uh, those are just the ones that come to my mind. Really, you could open up anywhere in the scriptures because God's character is on display from start to finish. But take some time to see what God has to say about himself and reflect on those things. How have you seen those characteristics of God at work in your life in the last year? You know, for me, 
as I was thinking about this, the first thing that just immediately came to mind was just the kindness of God. I don't know if you often think about the kindness of God, but I've, I've seen it really plainly in the past year. You know, we've been partnering with God to plant a new church in Gig Harbor. And there's been so many moving parts with that. And it's really easy for me to try to get them all under my own control and get stressed out about them. And just when I'm at the brink of like, I don't know how this one small detail is going to happen. Somebody will like shoot me a text or, or see me like in passing and say, hey, I'm coming to that thing. Is there any, and is there any like small details I can help you with? I'm like, oh man, <laughs> Lord, you are so kind. Even in the little things, even when I'm in, in the middle of what feels just like a mess, God is so kind. And then I remember Romans 2 where it says that God's kindness leads us to repentance. I'm sorry, Lord, for trying to, to think that I could do all this in my own power. Help me to rely on you. And I begin just confessing God's goodness. Will you confess God this week? To end our time, I do want us to look at God's response back to the people. Because we don't just see how the people failed in their response to God. We see how God acts in response to their failure as well. Look with me at verses 17 to 21. But you are a God of forgiveness, merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry and unfailing in your loyal love. No, notice again how the people are just continually drawn to God's character. It's as if before they can say anything else, they just have to confess something about God. And this verse is just this like part of verse 17 is packed full of amazing truths about who God is and how he relates to, this pe to his people. In fact, they're actually quoting God's own words from elsewhere in scripture. In Exodus chapter 34, God passes in front of Moses and proclaims his name, his character, his identity. We actually get to see the people do this later on in chapter 9 as well. And so for that reason, I'm not going to talk about this today. Next week, we're going to step out of the book of Nehemiah and step into Exodus 34. And we're just going to explore what God has to say about himself because it seems to be central to what the people are saying about God here. But for now, let's, let's just continue looking at how God responds to rebellion. It says, you did not abandon them. Even when they made a cast image of a calf for themselves and said, this is your God who brought you up from Egypt. Or when they committed atrocious blasphemies. Due to your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not stop guiding them in the path by day, nor did the pillar of fire stop illuminating for them by night the path on which they should travel. You imparted your good spirit to instruct them. You did not withhold your manna from their mouths. You provided water for their thirst. For 40 years, you sustained them. Even in the wilderness, they never lacked anything. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. So, so how does God respond to his people's unfaithfulness? We see a couple of ways. First, we see God give his very presence to the people. Twice, they say, you did not abandon your people. Twice it says that. First, it was after they made a golden calf, which was a problem because Moses had just told the people, don't make any idols. And then they turned around and say, hey, let's make an idol. Well, let's make some kind of, you know, formed structural thing that we can express our worship to. They actually abandoned God through their rebellion, but God never abandoned them. And then again, as they wandered through the desert, they grumble and complain almost the entire time, but God does not abandon them. Rather, he gives them his own presence. He guides them by pillar of fire and pillar of cloud. He imparts his spirit to instruct them. Friend, God has not abandoned you. Maybe you say, yeah, but I'm in the middle of a desert season or I'm in the middle of a rebellion and I know it, but I don't know how to get out of it. God must have abandoned me. 
Nehemiah says no. God does not abandon his people. He's present with you. Not only does God provide his presence, though, he, he also responds by giving provision. Even though the people rebelled, says God provided manna from heaven and water from a rock in the middle of the desert. And while they wandered for 40 years, not knowing if they would ever make it to the promised land, it says that God provided everything they needed to be sustained. They lacked nothing. Their clothes didn't wear out. Their feet didn't swell. They were provided for in every possible way. Imagine the comfort that we find when we confess that our God is a God of presence and provision. Do you know that comfort? That comfort is here to be found in confession as we confess God. That comfort comes from the, the gospel truth that is here in confession. Our God does not abandon his people. In the wilderness, the, the people rebelled and groaned against God, but he did not abandon them. A couple generations before Nehemiah, the people were unfaithful and they were carried off into exile, but God did not abandon them. Instead, God moved through Nehemiah and the people. He brought them back to Jerusalem. He restored them. And in much the same way, God has not abandoned you. Jesus did not abandon us in our sin. Rather, he left heaven and came to earth to live as the perfectly embodied presence of the perfect God. He lived among us as one of us, present with us. And Jesus then lived a perfect, sinless life, a life that he gave up in order to provide for us the perfect sacrifice that we could never offer. And Jesus went to the cross and died in our place for our sin, providing for our ultimate needs, needs much more profound and fundamental than food and water. He provides for our needs of healing, of forgiveness, of grace, of restored relationship with God. But the power of Jesus' presence and provision does not stop with his death because Jesus didn't stay dead. He was resurrected, defeating death itself. Jesus abandoned the grave to prove that he will never abandon you. And then even as Jesus ascended into heaven, he didn't leave us alone. He didn't abandon us even for a moment. Rather, he sent the Holy Spirit to live among his people, to indwell his people. Friend, if you follow Jesus, this God of presence and provision will never be apart from you. He is with you. And what greater provision could there be? And this, this is true in, in the good times. This is true in, in the best seasons of life. It's also true in the messiest times. And if we're honest, this side of eternity, our life is bound to look much messier than we feel comfortable with or even care to admit. But the gospel does not stop when your life gets messy. The good news that God never abandons us, but gives us his presence and provision is waiting for us in the midst of the mess. So here's the heart of the matter today. In the mess, confess God first. In the mess, some of us might have this, this I don't know, religious instinct to simply confess everything that we've done to get us into the mess. But Nehemiah 9 tells us, no, 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 in the mess, confess God first. In the mess, pull your eyes off of the chaos that's going on around you and fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Confess God first. When, when you're so painfully aware of your own sin or the brokenness surrounding you, that you can't even see anything else, Nehemiah says, confess God first. 
when you're wondering whether you've been abandoned, whether there's any hope. Confess God first. And as you do, open your eyes and begin to see God move. You pray with me. Jesus, we confess that you are who you say you are. That you are fully God, fully man. That you did live a perfect life that we could never live. Not to abolish your law, but to fulfill it. We confess that any righteousness we have has been given to you, given to us by you, gifted by you. And we confess that our lives are messy and we need your help to confess. Lord, let us confess you first, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.